Hello, everyone, and welcome to our April 2022 Man Time Flies Compassion Chat. My name is Susan Marshall. I am the author of Mom's Gone Missing, When a Parent's Changing Life Up Ends Yours, and your host for Compassion Chats. We meet the fourth Tuesday of every month at six o'clock central where we bring phenomenal people to this community to share experience, to share tips, to share guidance, and really to help us appreciate the humanity of each and every one of us in this caregiving community. We are recording this chat, so we would ask that you mute during the early part. We will open it up for questions, for comments, for general discussion before we end. It is absolutely an honor and a privilege to welcome our guest tonight, Nancy Feingold. Nancy is a psychotherapist and grief counseling specialist who has helped countless people over decades of work. Um, and if you saw the, the brief bio she provided to us, she said she's entering her ninth decade. Fantastic. Nancy, it is truly an honor to welcome you this evening. Thanks so much for joining us to well, thank share your you expertise. Thank you for inviting me. Um, this is a, a group that I'm particularly interested in um, connecting with, uh, being helpful toward. And of course, I learn a great deal from anyone that I work with, uh, particularly about grief. Um, I must say that this is a kind of a coincidence, I just came back from a funeral. So I am sitting next to, or grief and death are sitting next to me and my 80th birthday is tomorrow. So grief and death are something that are quite close by, you know, we just have to have that as part of our living experience. Absolutely, well, happy birthday to you, Nancy. Yeah, thank you. At a quick note, it is a sad day in the Alzheimer's community. Elaine Schreiber, yes, who was Marty Schreiber's wife, he wrote the book My Two Elaine's Past yesterday morning early, I believe. Is that right, Nancy? I don't know exactly when, but uh, uh, they have been tremendous spokespeople and uh, uh, really brought about the idea of really being alive through all of life's experiences. Absolutely. Well, Nancy, we like to start our chats each month by getting to know a little bit personally about our guests. Okay. So if you would give us a little sort of background about yourself and how you came to do the work that you do. Well, um, I was actually in graduate school in social work. I'm a social work clinician. Um, and um, our last few credits, I took a course about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And um, she um, had been teaching at the University of Chicago and she developed this concept. She was a Swiss psychiatrist, by the way, but she came to the University of Chicago. This idea of stages of grief, which really she purported uh, this model for people who were dying, but it became part of our awareness of the stages of grief that people go through who have lost someone very dear to us. And I was fascinated, you know, grief and death and sex at that time were really um, not talked about, even in professional settings, you know, it was just not um, part of our consciousness. And I started working as a social worker clinician uh, in 1976, a while ago. And at each stage, of course, of the lives of people I worked with, there were kinds of uh, great caregiving. <laughs> you know, um, people, parents raising difficult children, um, people going through loss having to do with divorce, and then the shock of remarriage and stepchildren, that's a whole grieving process sometimes. So as I, the decades went by, of course, my uh, cohort is now people in approximately my age group. I have some people who are younger, but people I've seen over generations and they are dealing with the long, long caretaking involved in somebody having a very serious terminal or chronic disease 
people who have been taking care of their dementia, have a parent with dementia. I have several people who are dealing with it and you know they can talk to their friends and they can talk to their relatives some, um, but many of them have very feelings of kind of a dark feeling of dark emotions, dark stories in their head, and they can come to see a therapist or in a grief group to talk about some of their darker feelings that they're ashamed of. And so there's this whole this whole mix of feelings. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, when she found that people were talking about the stages, said, no, it isn't like that. I didn't mean it's a stepladder. It's a whole beehive of feelings. So here I am still practicing part-time and um, working a lot with um, grief. Well, we appreciate all of the experience that you've had, Nancy. And I think for many of us, as you mentioned, there are so many stages and ages of grief and it's, it's a life thing that we all have and we all carry with us. I think in this, in the context that we often meet and talk about with these compassion chats, the notion of grieving someone who has dementia and or Alzheimer's forms of, the grief is so confusing, oh, it always is. But in this instance, there's a loss before the loss. Yes. And it's a daily, sometimes hourly, sometimes every 10 minutes, we're losing something. And sometimes the loss is our own sense of self. And the fear that I know I've talked with many, and I'm sure you have over the course of your, your years of work, the, the fear that we're going to lose it, lose our sanity, lose ourselves, and then the panic that may set in. The, um, so grief is not pure, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's um, very, very complicated. And also it has, it's kind of like the weather. Um, <laughs> particularly in Wisconsin right now. Um, but um, it, it, it is surprising components because sometimes we feel guilty because we're happy to be free of that person for a few hours. Or that we even have thoughts of, oh my gosh, how will my future be? What will I want to do? I will be able to travel after my loved one is gone. And people feel sometimes confused and even ashamed of having these very human thoughts. Yes, and it's not the kind of thing as we often say in this forum that you kind of go to a cocktail party and say, hey, yes. what? Right. I'm, a mess. I'm grieving. Anybody yes. want to chat about that? But, but to your point, it is so very human. Yes. And I think intellectually, we understand that. I think mm -hmm. every one of us says, oh yes, that makes all the sense in the world. And I can be very compassionate for other people who are experiencing grief in whatever you know, iteration at the time. However, for myself, I should be better than that. I should be stronger than that. I should be able to move myself past this. And the fact of the matter is, you simply cannot think your way to a position where you're not grieving. Right, right. And often trying to be so good and to be called sometimes a spiritual bypass, that you jump over the feelings, the dark feelings, so that you can be, well, canonized at the end of the year or something. Very, very true. And so yeah. what's the value of not jumping over the darkness? Well, it's, again, we talked about humanness or hum our humanity. And we human beings are different from other species because we have these, well, some species have feelings too, I realize, but we have a more, uh, dis, uh, a more distinct set of feelings. Um, and um, we, we sometimes try to suppress them. And that often causes panic attacks or anxiety or burnout. If you ha don't have a chance to really tap into what you're feeling and honor it, you know, whatever it is, uh, your anger, your frustration, your feeling like you're not good enough, like you don't have enough patience. These are all things that you need to really sit with. And that means not 
not to suppress, not to run away from them because as Mr. Rogers said, feelings come and feelings go if you just honor them. Well, and that's, again, intellectually, I think we can all go, oh yeah, I get that. Mm -hmm. How do you do it, Nancy? How do you honor anger? How do you honor frustration? How do you honor resentment? Right. Well, it's for me, um, I have a meditation practice. And so when I meditate or when I go swimming or there are certain activities that I know I engage in that I can really allow myself to breathe deeply into from my gut actually and allow the tears or the anger or whatever it is to come forth. It means that I have to stop and allow it or swim and allow it, which is my style. <laughs> How do you manage that when you are in the midst of a situation where you cannot control, you cannot get the person you're caring for to understand what you're trying to do to help, you get impatient, you get frustrated. How in the world do you manage that? Well, it's interesting that you use the word manage. Um, sometimes we can't. Sometimes we need to have respite. And I'm sure that you talked about respite in previous sessions, um, but that can be having somebody take your place for a while. People sometimes are so reluctant to share the caregiving. Um, you need to have a break. You need to be able to think of some activities, perhaps music or recorded music or um, some other kind of activity where you and the caregiver, I mean, the person you're caring for, can, can be present. You don't always have to be doing something. And so that's one of the ways of dealing with some of this uh, intensity of the one-to-one -one relationship often, uh, eyeball to eyeball or whatever with this person, uh, is to do perhaps just being able to touch the person's hand and sit back and breathe with them, for example. Can you say more about that, Nancy? Because I know when I was dealing with mom and, and we've talked about this a little bit on some of our previous chats, I would just as soon sock her. Yes. As, as touch her, right? Yeah. Right. And, and, and obviously we know enough we can't do that. And yet sometimes when you simply lose, kind of you lose yourself in that moment, how do you recover A? And then B, do you have strategies to help us deal with um, the embarrassment, the shame, just that, that we're just so aghast that but we allow know. that to happen? Right. One of the things is journaling. If you can keep a journal and it can be just, it doesn't have to be complete sentences. It can be just little phrases or words, or even, um, for example, little drawings, little angry drawings, or getting out big pieces of newsprint and, and getting your feelings out that way. Because as you point out, we're not going to do it at the person that we're caring for. Another thing is it's so important to have friends that you can talk to honestly uh, about what's going on with you. And often as a non-family member, you know, uh, people outside of the family, somebody that, you know, you can, you can let your hair down with, so to speak. Uh, another thing which is so big in any kind of uh, emotional recovery is physical activity. Getting outside for 10, 20 minutes. I know that's what I did when I got home from this funeral. I, I just walked. I did as soon as I got out of the car because I knew if I came in the house, I wouldn't go. <laughs> uh, so yoga, walking, um, swimming, uh, anything to get your body moving. And there's a lot of documentation now for how we carry our feelings in our body Sure, we have thoughts, but our feelings are so much in our body that we need to be able to work with them uh, and it, express them through physical activity. So important now, and I think we're seeing um, an uptick in diseases of all kinds. 
yeah. because of the incredible stress that we've all been carrying these last number of years. Um, how do you suggest, I like your thought about talking with someone you know well and who knows you well. And again, it's kind of this intellectual, emotional struggle. I get that that's important. I don't know, and I'm speaking now for me personally as a very self-sufficient caregiver. Yes. I would not know how to start that conversation without feeling like if I said six words, I was going to absolutely collapse. Okay. Because well, I would be expressing this out loud. That would mean I am, I'm owning it, I guess. Yes. So, so talk to us about that. How do you even start those conversations? Right. Well, first of all, there are some lots of grief groups and some of them are through agencies um and some of them are um online for example there's one called tender hearts david kessler and this is very very helpful uh to people who are going through the brief process uh the other thing is i have to say that you can't afford to be hard on yourself if you just start crying or sobbing, or if you just feel like you're somewhere and you're talking to somebody and you have to say to them, you know, I just, I just can't even speak, I'm so upset. That's just part of being vulnerable and honest. Of course, again, that's with somebody that you trust. But if you wanna get involved, I think grief groups are the best. Um, in terms of people being able to have a safe space to talk about what's going on with other people who are also going through grief, but you'll find a variety of grief reactions and you won't feel so alone. You know, that, that feeling of aloneness is something we, we talk about a lot here. It is, it is true that we do feel like we, even if we're not alone, we're probably the worst. <laughs> Yeah, or, you know we're the we're the we're the most ready to snap and any yeah. moment, and we really don't want to share that publicly. I've also heard people say, you know what, support groups and grief groups, yeah, they're great. They're not for me because I really don't want to listen to everybody else's stuff. Yeah, how do you help us pass that? Well, I was one of those people. <laughs> I lost my husband, my late husband. Um, uh, 1997. And do you think I went to a grief group? No. <laughs> I'll practice with those people, but I'll have to tell you what I, what structure is so important, regaining some structure in your life. And I went back to work in a week. And that for me was, I knew myself. I knew that if I just sat home or continue to grieve with people that I might, I'm kind of a sink or swim person. And so I knew, and that was the best for me, although people didn't understand it, you know, but you have to find out what's best, best for you. So um, the other thing was that I remember shopping at, I'm in Madison, and I was shopping at um, what was then Century, and I saw a can of tomato something that my late husband had used to make a special dish of his and I started bawling in the grocery line and there wasn't anything I could do about it. You know, I just had to say this is what happened. This is this is what it is. So you can't always contain yourself and it always isn't always the best. Well, and I love that story, Nancy. And one of the things that I have learned through tough experience when you allow yourself to have those and express those emotions it's kind of like you give everybody else around you the permission mm -hmm. and the opportunity to do the same which oddly binds us it does and you know if we allow it grief does connect us with other people and we become aware of all the people who are grieving in the world all the people who are diving, dying in the world. And that's not to say that we wanna take away from our own personal story, but there's something about real, realizing the universality of loss and grief and breathing and realizing 
that this is just part, this is part of life. And life, uh, and definitely the amount you grieve is related to the amount you loved. That's a beautiful thought. And one that I think we need to be reminded of frequently. What happens, and, and maybe you can talk a little bit about the process of moving from or sliding from grief into depression and then what yeah well you know sometimes um that's a slippery slope uh unless people around you are really aware uh you can slip into that pretty easily especially for somebody who's been a caregiver for a long time because no matter what your feelings have been, no matter what rough times you've had, sometimes you have very rough times with somebody that you had loved and counted on, as you talked about, um, that um, actually, uh, go ahead, what was the question again? <laughs> how do, what do you do, how do you prevent the slide? Oh, okay, you can't really necessarily prevent it. I do recommend going to see your primary care physician. And that person can assess whether you would benefit from some kind of medical help. Uh, there's nothing wrong. I mean, I know some people who say they went off of their medicine because they didn't want to cut into the grief. They wanted to grieve more. But for many people, um, they want to keep functioning. That's the swimmer, <laughs> the sink or swim version of life. And sometimes uh, being willing to talk with your physician and learning about the possibility of some kind of antidepressant can help you get through the initial phases of it or long-term. So that's something that you should, you wanna be open to. You can even go get the prescription and decide not to take it. <laughs> but I mean, at least become educated about what's out there. Um, the other thing is, there's nothing like um, being close to people during the whole process uh, so that your friends do know more about what's going on for you so that you don't become a recluse. And I know somebody who lost her husband um, she was in her 50s and a friend came and took her to the pool every morning so that she would get out of her house. She would never have done it otherwise. So the caregivers need caregivers. Well, and so talk to us about that, because I don't need help. I'm good. I'm fine. Yeah. Even when I'm not, I will. I don't want to be a burden to anybody. I don't yeah. want to share. Everybody's got their own troubles. I don't want to add mine. I'm good. Right. Well, there are a lot of folks who, particularly in our culture, uh, who feel like they have to always be on or always be together. Uh, I'm not um, uh, evaluating that right now, although you could hear a tone of voice here. Anyway, <laughs> um, I think um, my mother, unfortunately, put on a really good show for a long time after my father died. And she was only in her 60s. And she, she fooled most people. And finally, when she went to her doctor, her doctor prescribed something, but she also said, you have four children, you go and visit each one of them. So, you know, she was not wanting to be a burden. God forbid she would ever, you know, but she really needed that. And um, that was good advice. So I think seeing a professional person, your physician going to a, a if you're noticing, I mean, nobody can know be inside of you, but if somebody has a hunch that the caregiver is slipping, uh, because even if they didn't like the person they cared for, when their person has passed on, there's a big hole in your life. You've been doing this. This is what your center of your life has been. You didn't think you liked it, but now you don't know what to do with yourself. So, it's important to pay attention to the person who's been caregiving and 
sometimes that person needs you to reach out to them, even if they're resistant. Well, and so I was on the other side of that equation. I was just fine. Thank you very much. And mm -hmm. I know, in fact, wrote about in my book, I spent two years after mom passed. I had no idea who I was, uh -huh. what to do. I was as lost as a human can be. Yeah. And somehow those two years passed. I didn't do work with a grief counselor, probably should have. But how do, how do we start? particularly when, or let me ask this differently. If you know of a caregiver, as you say, and you can see they're struggling or you can see that they're sad, how do you approach that individual when they, when the mask is up, when at the, you know, I'm all good. How do you yeah. bring that? Well, one of the things you can do is not go head on about the grief, but to ask the person if they could go for a walk with you someday, uh, that you miss them that you would like um, uh, to um, get together and go to a movie. Something that isn't, you know, requiring the person to be more vulnerable than they're willing to be. And again, you know, Susan, we have defenses for a reason. Your two years were for a reason. And my going back to work in a week was for a reason. Even though other people were like, you what, you know, you what? You know, you know, we kind of have to be willing to know ourselves. And uh, sometimes it takes not, you know, process discussions, not talking about the loss, but having people reach out to include them back into the world. You know, they're they haven't really been, sometimes you haven't been part of the world. Oh, it's so very true. And I love the three words that you mentioned. I miss you. Yes. That's personal. That's mm -hmm. completely non judgmental. I'm sharing now my feeling. Mm -hmm. See how that would just start to waterworks, frankly. Yeah. And not asking a lot of questions. That's hard. Um, that's that's a practice I'm in, I'm practicing that not in my professional work in my personal work not at, at this funeral we went to you know today uh just up at green lake and um people you know there were a lot of people who were a lot closer to the person who was deceased but you know i made a practice of just being present for them rather than a lot of questions um and that can just be eye contact um a little a little touch on the elbow um These are things that are connections that are very, very important to people. Uh, and instead of saying, how are you doing? You can say, how are you today? You know? Yeah. What you're describing, Nancy, feels um, gentle. It feels non-intrusive. And it doesn't feel like I'm expecting you to respond to an overture because I'm kind and giving and wonderful, right? I have to tell you, I could feel ashamed about this, but I must have received 50 lovely invitations after my husband died, and I didn't accept any of them because I just wanted to work and be with my family for a while. And it was kind of not very gracious, but we also need to give people who are grieving a lot of room a lot of spaciousness because we don't know their process and just because they are spending some time alone or a lot of time alone doesn't mean they're depressed we have to know more and that can be a hard um judgment call to make mm -hmm. so yeah no i appreciate you saying that i'd like to touch on another aspect of grieving quickly and then i want to i'll stop talking and let i'll stop to ask questions well, no we want to we want you to keep talking but <laughs> there's an aspect of grieving and certainly caregiving itself that has to do with coping mm -hmm. and coping obviously is key for all of us but coping can become a trap in itself and you're it, talking about that you did for two years no, um, it's, it's things like if I cope through exercise, oh. if I binge watch Downton Abbey, 
Yes. I, you know, whatever, whatever that coping yeah. thing is I do to get me through, when does that become a crutch or a habit? And now it becomes toxic to me. Okay. Um, well, anytime that exercise is, takes over your life, um, either because of eating disorders or other things or, or trying to um, counter grief, um, we, have to, we have to have people in our lives who know we're doing it to, to confront us in a lovely way, I hope, about what you're doing. Uh, alcohol can become a problem, a big problem uh, for people who are um, prone to have alcohol problems. Um, even, um, yes, I don't know, binge watching Downton Abbey. I don't know. I think that might be therapeutic. But <laughs> no, but the point is anything that keeps you from getting the right, right amount of sleep, nutrition, rest, um, and having, avoiding isolation are things to be concerned about. Otherwise, what can I say about binge watching? I better be careful. <laughs> well, I, I, I was going to stop. I've got one more just based on what you said, that R word, rest. Are you kidding me? Yeah. How? Yeah. Uh, my brain won't stop. Yeah. I, I, it, it, how, how do we rest? Well, I am a big, um, professionally and personally, a big advocate of mindfulness meditation huge and i have um used it in my life i also have referred i do teach people in my practice but again i highly recommend doing it in a group uh learning mindfulness meditation it helps you stay in the present and with yourself and with others and a lot of grief is anxiety and that's about the future and so mindfulness meditation brings you back to the present. What do I need to do right now? I better fix myself some lunch with a little protein. Or I better um, drink something else at night uh, besides brandy. Or, you know, um, I better, you know, being aware of what you're doing right now is a way of cutting down any anxiety and making some good decisions because if you get lost in that never never land of the future um it's terrifying for many reasons reality yeah. probably isn't as terrifying as the fears that we develop so so true yeah so true but if i obsess about the future i can escape my grief today yeah <laughs> Which doesn't work. Kind of, yes. Yeah. 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 It's it's all right now. I do have another question that I'll come back to, but I want to open it up for questions, comments, stories, something that you would like Nancy to speak on or you would like to share with us mm -hmm. as a caregiving community. No brave souls here. Okay. okay. I am going to then ask you, Nancy, about the use of humor in terms of grieving, because that can cut really sharply if, if inappropriately used or, you know, I mean, that's a big mistake we could make. Uh huh. But is it, is it a tool for, for managing grief? Well, I think that um, laughter and talking, you know, sharing funny stories and um, enjoying the process of living is such an important part of grief because we are tunnel visioned when we're grieving uh, for good reason. You know, we, we just feel this huge hole inside of us. And what's really nice I've noticed at funerals sometimes <laughs> is that we get together with loved ones that we haven't seen for a couple, in some cases, scores of years, and we do laugh. And we, it's so healthy to be able to laugh, but you don't want it to be at anybody's expense. So I would take 
cues from the grieving person. Um, I, I think laughter is the, well, the only thing that's gonna carry us through sometimes. It's such a beautiful thing. It's, it's, the, it's the, other, the other side of, of tears. We is need that, it all. Yeah, is that part of the work that you do, Nancy, is helping people rediscover joy? That Absolutely. That's a strange word when you're, when you're in the midst of feeling so horrible. It's yeah. like joy? What, what is that? Well, not only joy, but meaning in life. Uh, that's David Kessler, whom I referred to earlier, uh, who's probably one of the best and biggest names in grief right now, professionally. Um, he um, definitely um, talks about that next stage of grief, you know, after all the other stages, is finding meaning and joy in life again. I'm adding and joy, but uh, he talks about finding meaning. And that can be something like, oh, setting up like Shriver, the Alzheimer's, you know, a big cause, or it can be a little cause. It can be something like making sure that you connect more often with the five-year-old next door and asking that five-year-old how school was today when he walks home. Uh, finding joy through connection with other people. And uh, if you can, uh, finding joy in um, rituals uh, that uh, are meaningful to you. And recalling the fun times or the good times that you had with the person, holding that close to your heart. Um, because we're rarely in a position of caring for somebody that we didn't have a relationship with unless we're a professional caregiver. And even then, you know, people into their last days can um, laugh and um, can share an, a story from, the, from long ago or the surprising things that happen with people even when they're struggling cognitively. We discovered at the end of mom's journey when she we moved her to Wisconsin she was a butt pincher oh okay and it was humiliating when yeah. we realized it and it was absolutely hysterical in fact I wrote um, in the book about arranging mom's memorial service with my pastor at church and told him that this had happened and he said well she never tried to pinch mine <laughs> now I feel yeah. kind of you know neglected. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was irreverent, but it was funny, and it was so. Yeah, right. the point of all of this, it was so very human. That's right. And that's silly stuff. It's right. We're just we're just humans. We're we're close to the angels and and close to the animals on both sides. <laughs> we are just humans, and we are remarkable humans, each yes. and every one of us. Even when and I and I have days where it's me and a dog. I yes. will walk downstairs from the second floor and say, Lacey, I am so crabby today. Yes. It's like, good wow. to have someone I'll to say that. that out loud. And then it's like, okay, yeah. choose something different. And I think it's just that. I'm sorry. I just wanted to comment about the dog. Sometimes having um, a pet is really a good idea after someone has died. Uh, not the next day, but you know, down the road, it can really help with depression a lot to have a pet because that's that connection you know someone to come home to uh someone to annoy you <laughs> someone to feed <laughs> someone to love you and that you'll love back and that's what we crave is having loving connections and that's what so much about laughing with somebody is a loving connection when it's a well well-meaning laugh Absolutely. You have such a lovely way about you, Nancy. Oh, thank you. Knowledgeable and gentle and obviously a wonderful sense of humor. I want to offer one more time. I, I don't want to say good evening yet, yeah. uh, but I want to offer one more time if anybody has an additional question or something that's troubling you right now with regard to this whole grief journey. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question. And that is, um, my husband has been gone for seven years. I have three grown sons. 
And one of them has lived in out of the country for a good six years, recently moved from Abu Dhabi to Ireland and is engaged and going to be getting married. Congratulations. Um, and thank you. And meanwhile, I have moved on and I've had a boyfriend for the last three years. Oh. And um, my son, when he was home over Easter, he came home for a week to visit. And when he was home, he said, you know, mom, he said, I, I hope you don't mind me telling you this, but I prefer that your boyfriend not be at my wedding. Because he said, I think I'm going, you know, I'd really wanted dad to be at my wedding. Uh -huh. And seeing you with another man doesn't seem like it's going to feel right. And he said, you know, that's, that's what I want. And, and I, I said to him, I just, I wasn't real accepting of that because I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do? You know, I, yeah. my mom and a couple of my siblings may be going over there with me. The wedding is in Ireland in September, but it's like, this, this guy is a part of my life. He's not yeah. there every day, but you know, is yeah. this, is this an appropriate response? And there, is there some response I can give back to him to, to possibly convince him otherwise? Well, you, you might want to talk to him about the fact that since he was gone all this time, he didn't have a chance to really move on in the way that you have. I mean, you, your life is, is going on. His life is going on. He's getting married. But I mean, he hasn't been here through all the ups and downs that you've been through. And that you're, you would like him to be able to honor the fact that your life is moving on. And you still, I don't know how you feel about saying this, but you still <clears throat> have love in your heart for his father. Uh, and yet there's room for the boy, the man in your life. And you would like him to take some time to think about that. I don't know that there's any, it's a very, very kind of a, uh, I don't know whether there's any answer to it. Um, how do you feel? I feel very awkward. I feel like I'm, you know, putting the proverbial between the rock and the hard place. Yeah. You know, I, I know my mother who's 85 is also going along on this trip or that's the plan at this point in time. And so I know I'm going to have to spend some of my time probably entertaining her. I, I don't have commitment from any of my siblings yet, whether any of them are going to be coming along or not. Uh -oh. And so it's, it is the kind of situation where I may have to divide time between boyfriend and mom if they both come. Yeah. But you at the same be. time. Yeah, I'd like I'd like to have them there. Would you have you had a chance to really express your feelings to your son? I did. You know, I said to him, I said, hey, this this guy is the guy that I'm having the you know the time of my life with. And it's, you know, I'd like him to be there. I said, you know, so when they have dances at weddings, I said, what am I supposed to do? Sit in a chair or find, you know, some stranger to dance with? Right. And he's like, oh, mom, it's only. He said, I'm only talking about like the day before and the day of the wedding. He said, if you want to have him come along for the rest of your vacation, that's okay. And I'm like, oh, nice. <laughs> well, he's got some growing up to do, but all of our adult children do. And um, excuse me, I'm just allergic today with all the welcome pollen. That's okay. <clears throat> um, you, you. I think you have to talk with your son some more. Do you know his bride? No, I've met her only by Zoom. I've never met her in person. Right, right. Oh, that she, she lost her mom to cancer a year and a half ago. And then she just lost her grandma two weeks ago to old age. Okay. So she's had some death things she's been dealing with as well. Uh, yeah, well, I think nothing uh, is more productive than being able to really talk with your son or perhaps even send him a letter, a handwritten letter. I don't know whether you do that anymore, but uh, letting him know that um, it will not be a joyous occasion for you if you can't celebrate it with, what's your partner's first name? Steve. Yeah, if you can't enjoy it with Steve. 
Um, and you, you might just um, implore him to be, to honor the fact that you need to have a life. I don't know how well that will go over, but it's part of his growing up to accept that. It's not, he's not um, alone in this kind of feeling, you know, um, but uh, you need to have your life and you need to have Steve at your side. Uh, so I would keep working with him, with your son, trying to get him to understand. Do you talk on the phone at all or is this all text? We, we do talk, yeah. Yeah, I would try to have a talk with him about it. Uh, and then, you know, you'll have to make your choice. You know, maybe you'll, you will have Steve come with you and then see what happens when you get there. If, he'll, if your son will change his mind. You know, Nancy, I want to just echo something um, yeah. that you said that really struck me and Liz may be helpful. The, the, just the phrase, there's room in your heart mm -hmm. for both. Right. And, and that is, in my thinking, represents an end state that you can share together. Um, and is it a co-processing of grief, Nancy, in this regard? Well, um, have you, has your son, it's hard for me to know without knowing, the, personally knowing the son too. Um, but um, yeah, it is, it's part of it, you know. Uh, Kids, my grown kids were very unhappy. I am married again. <laughs> and um, it's, it's been a difficult process. You know, for the kids who are here, my daughter who's here, it's, they know him. He's part of our life. He's, you know, but for my son who lives abroad, it's been really different and not very accepting because he doesn't, didn't get to see me go through all these phases and how important it is for me to have a life. Yeah, I, I think mean, that that seems to be part of it is that he feels he doesn't know this man. And so right. he said, he said, I feel like I'm inviting a stranger to my yeah. wedding. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, he'll get to know him if he's there. <laughs> <laughs> he'll become a part of the family history that way. You know, that he's there, he's part of you. Steve is part of you now, right? That's that's what I feel, but I don't think my son's accepting that. Well, you let it, you can let him know it, even if he doesn't accept it. In other words, um, volley the ball back to him. You know, tell him how it is for you, and you want him to think about it. You don't want him to answer right now. Uh, the position you'll be in at the wedding, it will not be a, a happy occasion for you if you just need to be taking care of your mom, whom you want to take care of and you want her to be there. Um, by the way, when we took my mother abroad, it, she was already having a lot of trouble at 85. Uh, we hired somebody at the wedding to take help with her so that I could have fun. It was my son's wedding. Ah, interesting. I not like it. <laughs> I warn you, but it was so important because I wanted to enjoy myself. Yeah. And I don't think she ever forgave me, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. That's awesome. Hilda, were you going to also? Ask yes. I, yes, I'm ready to say something because I'm really relating to a lot of this. Um, thank you so much for sharing today. Um, uh, my, I'm having, my mother lives with me. It's going on almost two years, right? So we've all obviously had to do a lot of adjusting. Um, you know, the living room is taken over by her. <laughs> you know, she's watching TV all the time. And, yeah. and uh, just, just recently, I just this week, I actually found someone to come in for a few hours. I mean, it's, you know, it's expensive, but I, I just... Uh, you know, I just thought, you know, I'm going to just try to find someone to come in and people like at my church are being really helpful. Like some, I go to a life group, I take her to the life group with me. So she gets that kind of outing. She goes to church with me. Okay. My husband and I always take her out. I mean, she, she's mobile. She 
has a little problems walking, but okay. for the most part, you know, she's pretty, she's pretty good shape considering a hip injury, but uh, we have a, a, a trip planned this in May. We're going over to St. Petersburg, Florida, and we're taking her because uh, we have a great honor of my great uncle getting a ship commissioned after him. Oh so God. we're going to take her to that. Yeah. And, and, and so then right after that, my granddaughter, we're gonna, we're gonna, we were going to go longer and then fly to see my granddaughter who's in Maryland, but we decided it'd be too hard with her. So we're coming back. And then a week later, we're flying to Maryland uh, for my granddaughter's dance recital and for uh, a nephew's wedding in Michigan. So that's one of the reasons why I brought this lady in. I'm trying to make these arrangements because I've never left my mom, right? Oh. And so, so we're planning to go for like 11 days. So anyway, I have to introduce people slowly. So I introduced this one caregiver that came in and I also have friends that are gonna help me out. She, yesterday she was having a good time with this lady but then I, I talked to the lady about overnight, but she probably won't be the one that does it. But anyway, I was just mentioning it. Oh, my mom got, did not like, she did not like the fact right. that we were going on the trip. And even though she says, oh yeah, go, go. But she was, you could see that she just, oh my gosh, she got really, she asked about her dog first. She's going to take care of my dog, which I have yeah. to take care of her dog as yeah. well. Yeah. And, and you said, okay, bring a dog. Well, that's the story. So no, you need a break from the dog too. I need a break from the, <laughs> break from the dog too. True. So anyway, I said, don't worry about it. I've already got someone to watch the dog. I meant when we were taking her to Florida. And then she's like, well, I don't want to go. And I was like, I said, it's it's your it's your uncle's commit, you know, it's a thing. And so yeah. she was kind of huffy all yeah. like night. I just didn't feel like dealing with it, right? So I did my escapism, you know, which was either watch TV or go to the other room or whatever, go take a nap. But um, anyway, today she's better, but I know that I'm leaving her for 11 days and I and I have a very good friend who's going to stay. In, I, we just settled this today. She's going to sure. stay at the house and some of my mom's good friends are coming in one of the weekends. So, and my, my son and, and daughter-in-law are only about 15 minutes away but she my mother's funny about even going to my to her grandson's yes, house she likes the situation with a daughter that hasn't left her for two years <laughs> yes. she's too good of a caretaker yeah well she likes it to a certain extent but she wants to go back to her to her condo she still thinks she's she, her oh. condo is four hours away she thinks she can yeah. still live there okay she's very feisty in that way okay. so anyway i guess uh Hearing you talk about having a life, I'm just, I think I'm I, like yesterday when she was getting irritated, I was starting to feel like I was going to get irritated because I was yes. like, you know what, we've kind of basically given our life up yes, uh, and, and included you in every single thing uh -huh. and you're sick or there. And I was just like, you know, I said to her, I, I actually said to her, look, mom, Steve and I need to just get away, you know, <laughs> just we need to get good, away. you know, and she's like, go and ahead, go ahead. Tough love it's called. Yeah, I was a little tough love yesterday. Yes. I was just like, you know what? Um, and I think, you know, I've just, I find myself sometimes stressing because I, I, I'm watching her and then like, I watch a little, a little child, which is fine. It's, he's a little baby that comes over. We love him dearly. And she gets to get enjoyment from that, right? Like three oh. days a week. She loves that. I love it. But when I'm off, which is like a Monday and a Friday, of course, weekends, I'm either making appointments for her or appointments for me or appointments for somebody, you know? Yeah. So it's like, it's a, it's a big thing. So it's like, I just need to like, not get caught up in worrying that if I leave, you know, she's, that she's going to be all right. I guess that's well, the thing. You know, she may or may not be all right, but you have to go. Yeah. You know, this is something that we can't control no matter how many caretakers you're doing the best you can and getting all these people. Oh, my goodness. What a wonderful setup you've made. <laughs> her. But you need to go and you need to let go. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, while you're gone. And when you come back, I would recommend that you have a more regular, um, perhaps mini vacation every week. Like yeah. go meet a friend for coffee or something so that your mom um, doesn't have the expectation that you've created. 
that I'm always here with, yeah. that I'm always yeah. around. Yeah, probably. Uh, you're wonderful. Yeah. You're absolutely wonderful to be that kind of daughter. But it's yeah. you need to replenish yourself, and that's the huge part of being a caregiver is that you need to replenish yourself, however yeah. you can do it. And this sounds like a good plan. And um, go for it, and just be matter of fact with her, Mom. I'm sorry you don't like it, but this is what it is. Yeah. 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 I know. I'm, I'm too. She'll, I'm she's sorry. still growing. She's still growing up. She's she hitting definitely yeah. is. Yes. She definitely is. Yes. She does. She's a little pouting and Very everything. Nice to meet you, folks. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, Nancy. Uh, you, thank you. You're like mm -hmm. I say. You're full of advice, but your manner is so lovely. Thank you. Um, and and I've learned from you. I know we all have this evening. I think I it's been a privilege yeah. to come on to this program. I think so it's a much. wonderful program. Well, thank Anybody you. Anybody else? I'm here. <laughs> I think we have to turn off. Yes, I do want to take a minute to thank Josh Effinger, our video recorder and editor, um, yes. for his wonderful work for us. Yes. Uh, Lucia, you have one a question, yeah. a final? No. Just saying hello and goodbye. Okay. <laughs> I I would have shared earlier, but then I would have done one of these, and I'm like, I'm not doing that tonight. <laughs> oh, oh, maybe. No, mm -mm. Okay. Nope. We know it's the cut. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's fine. Right. I, what did I say? I. No, well, you're I, in a professional yeah. role right now, so. Oh yeah. what, no. Um, what did I say last time? I'm like, are we okay? Uh, no, we're fine, but we're definitely not okay. Okay, I love it. <laughs> love it. Okay. That's a wonderful closing thought, actually. Thank you again, Nancy, for being Thank with you us. Thank you all. Okay, yes. Nice to meet you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you next month. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.